Hello and welcome to the Relax It's Retirement podcast with your host, Josh Leonard, where we talk about transitioning into retirement with intent. I'm Wendy McConnell. Hi, Josh. You're still in Pittsburgh or are you in Pittsburgh again? I'm back in Pittsburgh again. So, you know, it's a regular occurrence. We have a lot of great clients here in Pittsburgh. So I spend a lot of time here and, you know, got to keep an eye on Pete too, you know? Oh, sure. I can see that. Uh, In particular, we have one fantastic client that was kind enough to come on the podcast today. Uh, Jack Miller is not only a client, but also the principal of Miller Miller Consulting here in Pittsburgh. His development career spans more than 40 years. He has expertise in helping donors optimize the tax benefits while supporting their families and favorite charities through the use of assets such as cash, real estate, and tangible property. Jack's efforts include orchestrating the largest non-bequest gift in Baptist Homes Foundation history and developing a financial model that raised $3 million for its new chapel. His work with Pittsburgh History and Landmarks Foundation led to a significant grant that supported the conservation of historic farms using planned giving tools. And with the United Way of Allegheny County, his work earned the organization an award for having the best planned giving program in the country. Aside from his professional achievements, Jack has been actively involved in philanthropic advocacy and giving. He presided over the Pittsburgh Planned Giving Council and played a crucial role in legislative efforts that enabled Pennsylvania charities to issue gift annuities. His personal commitment to charity is demonstrated through diverse and leveraged giving strategies, and he and his wife employ to ensure a lasting legacy. Jack's educational background includes a distinguished graduation from Bethany College, West Virginia. After attending Bowdoin College in Maine, he remains a prominent speaker on topics related to donor advocacy and planned giving, sharing his knowledge at national conferences and symposium. Jack and his wife Donna have been together since 1975, residing in Pittsburgh. They have three children and five grandchildren. So with all of that, Jack... Welcome to the Relax It's Retirement podcast. Thanks. Do we have any time left? We do. Program? We do. A little bit of time to talk. Um, and and Jack, we've certainly talked a lot about charitable giving techniques. I think one of the things that uh, really connected us and, and started our relationship more is more than just me emailing you a lot uh, was our connection with the Red Door that we were talking about here a little bit earlier. Diane, that worked on our team, uh, had had brought the Red Door to us as a charity. And with our Shred Day event, we partnered to help raise money for them. Right. For your uh, viewers, I'm not a fan of organizations trying to pull me in by giving me something. Uh, Doing practical things that relate to what my goals are is what pulled me in. And uh, anybody who has the common sense to realize that older people like myself need to get rid of important documents after a while. Um, That got my attention initially, but it did take me seven years before I trusted Josh and his team enough to commit personally with some of my assets. Yeah. And, uh, you know, trust is built over time, like in any great relationship. So, uh, you know, ever since Jack became a client, he's been, we've been talking about different ways to share his story. So let's jump right into that. Let's talk about your giving story. Uh, We'll link a PDF in the notes for folks, too, so if they want to read through it, uh, we'll have that available to them as well. But what's your giving story, Jack? Well, in short, one of my goals, because of how I, 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 my personal faith journey is that, you know, a lot of religious organizations say you have to give 10% because that's what we're called to do is to Mm -hmm. tithe. But if you think about it, what we're called to do is give everything we have. And people might say, well, there's no way I'm going to give everything I have to an organization. But what people don't realize is that you really can using a lot of the tools out there. And and one of my goals is to give everything back, sort of along the Andrew Carnegie strategy without some of the violence and controversy at the plant. Um, But at the end of the day, to use the knowledge and skills that I have to help the organizations that my wife and I care about. And there have been a lot of things going on now, both in legislation and creative charitable tools that are available to help people do that. And if I can give one quick Mm -hmm. example, uh, 
the charitable IRA rollover, which is technically a qualified charitable distribution, has been a great tool uh, for anybody who has a traditional IRA because that's all taxable money. In some years back, the, the law was changed so that an individual could give up to $100,000 a year in a direct payment to charity, and it counted towards the required minimum distribution. Um, and in at the end of 2022, with the most recent tax law change, uh, that was amended to the point where you were allowed to make a one-time life gift where you could actually receive income from uh, a gift up to $50,000, which has now been indexed for inflation. It was $53,000 this year. So um, each of us, you in particular, have to look at your own situation and where you are and what your goals are. That's where things have to start. Mm -hmm. Josh and his team know that. It's not, what do I have and what can I do with it? It's, what do I want and how do I get there? That's a big distinction. So um, the most important things in our lives, hopefully, are faith, family, and community in that order, not government. (laughs) Government should be last, but in the real chart, government comes first. They're the first item off your paycheck. They're the first item at the end of the year, you know, April 15th. We just passed through that. So um, my wife is the most important person in my life. And uh, I had a recent health situation where I don't have as long a life expectancy as she does. So I was able to use that qualified charitable distribution gift to establish a gift annuity for her using $53,000. And she's getting 6.2% for the rest of her life, and we were able to move that money over Mm tax-free, and the income is taxable, not the total distribution. Why is that important? Well, I'm in a 12% tax bracket. took a lot of work to get there. But if I would have brought that $53,000 over and realized and then done the annuity, I would have been bumped up to a 22% tax bracket, and that's more money the government gets. It's supposed to work the other way. I'm not opposed. Don't get me wrong. I am not opposed to paying taxes. Certainly. I am I am opposed to paying more taxes than I should be paying. And knowledge gives us the power to recognize how to pay our taxes in the most cost-effective way while putting our priorities before anybody else's. Yeah, and I think, uh, you know, we talk to clients a lot about the power of giving at your own direction, right? If you're giving 22 cents on the dollar to Uncle Sam, Uncle Sam's going to do based on this mass consensus that our politicians decide for us and we vote them in. But it's a very diluted system. Um, Your charitable giving, you can direct to causes that you care about and focus them in your community as well. Um, You know, I think having a income distribution from an asset that also benefits charity is a pretty powerful tool in retirement as well. Um, what cause did you support with that, Jack? Well, uh, I had a teacher, uh, and to be honest with you, if we're being totally honest here, I have to shoot you if you tell anybody this. Um, I'm, I'm not a big fan of the arts. It's just me. Uh, uh, it's not my nature, but in grade school, a grade school, which is only about eight miles from where we're sitting right now, a little Catholic grade school on the north side of Pittsburgh. We had a teacher who came in on a part-time basis. Mrs. Cribbins was her name. And she made us sing. And she brought us all together. And her passion for the arts inspired me and my classmates, who are not well-to-do people. So when we had a reunion a few years back, we decided we wanted to set up a scholarship for her through the Diocese of Pittsburgh for children who wanted to participate in the arts and to give them a little kickstart. To endow a scholarship with the Diocese of Pittsburgh was $25,000. We didn't have $25,000 just sitting around. Now, I'm trying to tell you out there, do what makes the most sense from an overall planning standpoint. So what was the best way to do that? Well, at that time, uh, our little alumni group was able to put together $5,000. And to make sure that that scholarship would eventually get endowed, my wife agreed to allow me to put into our insurance policy uh, a designation of $20,000 to make up that difference when I died. Now, Josh, I'm going to ask you a question. I'm putting him on the spot now, okay? (laughs) Why would using insurance money be a negative 
in my situation. Be a negative? Well, that money's not going to go back to your family, and your family would not get the tax advantage of life insurance. See, that's why he's smart. <laughs> that's absolutely right. You know, but at the time, it was the only way I could do that. Until this tax law change occurred. Yep. Jack, I'm going to pause you for one second. So let's let's make sure that listeners understand that. So in most cases, your life insurance policies, when they pay to your beneficiaries, that means you passed away. That's a tax-free event. That's why life insurance is used in estate planning and tax planning a lot. It's a great asset to pass on. So you can send that to a charity too, which is a, a great thing to do. Right. Certainly uh, a cheaper way if you think about paying life insurance over time maybe you could get a little more leverage there throughout your lifetime but we we lose that tax advantage for the family uh the charity doesn't need that tax advantage right because they're non-taxable entities right, right. so uh, the whole idea was to do something in a better way so the charity came off of our insurance policy and that twenty thousand went back to the family and we used taxable money that now became non-taxable to set up a life income stream for my wife. And the other nice thing about that, this is what excites me, is the diocese was able to immediately start making payments for the children because they had an irrevocable guaranteed pot of money that they could use to generate income. Yeah. yeah. So um, that's the perfect situation. And, you know, I've, you've heard me talk before, and I need to share it with your viewers. The secret to being smart when it comes to taxes, in my opinion, is taking a leveraged opportunity to create deductions for yourself by supporting the organizations you believe in and care about so that the government subsidizes the gift and not you. Um, I want my taxes to go where I want them to go. I realize we've got to cover the military, cover the roads, but there are a lot of things the government covers that I don't believe in. And I find morally offensive. So this is a way for me to, in some way, control that. So what are the leveraging tools? I mean, life insurance is a perfect example of something that, you know, if you have a policy and you don't need it anymore, like all of your children are finally gone, if you're lucky enough to have that happen, and they're gainfully employed on their own, that's great. Um, now you have these policies that you purchased years ago, and some of them are whole life. And you can get an immediate deduction, charitable deduction, for give it, making a charity the owner and beneficiary of those policies. Use the deduction to offset other income you may take from an IRA or a retirement plan. And now you've done two good things um, when otherwise you wouldn't have been doing any good thing. So leveraging opportunities are fine. And that's just like why if you're going to make an outright gift to a charity, don't give cash. I mean, you can give cash, but cash isn't the best gift for you. Cash is the best gift for the charity. Appreciated assets like you bought Coca-Cola stock at $20 a share and it's at 60 now. That's great. Give the stock because you don't have to pay tax on the capital gain. And you get credit for the full value of the gift from a charitable deduction standpoint. These may sound like little things, but they add up when you group them together. And Josh, if I can, mm -hmm. I'd like to talk about another leveraging tool that most people, particularly in Western Pennsylvania, have. If I were to ask you viewers, what's the the number one asset that you have that's paid off and you consider a foundational asset, most of you are going to say, my home. My home is my most important asset. You may see people talking to you about look at a reverse mortgage and all these different strategies, which I don't get into. That's Josh's department, not <laughs> mine. But I will tell you that there is a charitable tool called a retained life estate, whereby you can immediately today give your home to a charity and retain the right to live in it for the rest of your life. And for that gift, you will receive a deduction now, not for the full value of the home because you're retaining a right to live in it, right. but there's an actuarial calculation that can determine what it is. It's usually about 50%. So think about this for a minute. Your own situation. I have an IRA. I have a house that's worth $300,000. My wife and I have agreed to give it to charity. Uh, we're going to get a $150,000 deduction. What can we do with the deduction? Because they've increased the standard 
deduction. Well, gee whiz, $150,000 is over the standard deduction. Let's take $150,000 out of our traditional IRA and we can live on that. We can invest that. We can do something with that to help our kids, to whatever we need to do. So those are the kinds of things that get me excited yeah. about talking with folks in the field. Well, and I think to me, you're saying that and I'm like, say, say Roth, say Roth. Say oh, Roth. Well, no. <laughs> because and, and I think that um, you know, our conversations, I think when we were preparing for the show, yeah. that is really where um people can get gigantic uh leverage is yeah. applying yeah. multiple strategies. And you know, if like in, in your scenario, Jack, if you're not gonna use that money and you can put it into a Roth IRA, that's gonna continue to grow tax deferred and distribute tax free whether you use it and you could gift it to you know gift it to whoever you want throughout your lifetime or it's a great asset to inherit this is why josh is the host of the show it's called <laughs> segway which i had gotten off path but i'm going to cover two things with his one prompt there um and i did this one of the things on our list the cover is mm -hmm. donor advised fund which is another great way to make gifts now even if you don't want to make the gift now to a charity you can make the gift to the donor advised fund to get the deduction and what have you but in a real life example one of the things that i did was i had a piece of land that had appreciated significantly in value it had about a 10 percent basis and um at the time i was with the pittsburgh history landmarks foundation which helped save my church on the north side of pittsburgh i had a personal attachment to it uh, for what it did to support my life. You know where that grade school is that I went to, where those kids were that I grew up with, people that I loved and cared about. So I wanted to do something for them. So my wife and I gave this piece of real estate. We received about a $150,000 deduction. And what we did with that deduction at that time is we didn't take but, money. Jack, I'm going to pause you there for yeah. a second. How much did you pay for the land? Uh, as I recollect, it was twenty thousand dollars, or it was so a substantial gain. Uh, yeah, yeah. And, you know, I if they're paying attention out there, I already <laughs> talked about appreciated assets. Yeah. So we had a triple whammy here in a good sense. So we we used the deduction to roll over money that I had in a traditional IRA because. In 1971, when I started saving, uh, and I'm a saveaholic, all there was was a traditional IRA. So at the time, 90% of my savings were in traditional IRAs. I had no Roth until they started to come out with the Roth. So I was able to move $140,000, which now represents half of my total Roth holdings, which represents roughly 30% of my net worth. So that one gift, which was made not because of the conversion, was made because we wanted to support the organization we cared about. We were able to get an avoidance of capital gains on the appreciation of the real estate, get the full deduction, use the deduction to move assets from the traditional IRA to the Roth. And, and that has helped put us in the position now where I'm able to live in retirement without sure. depending upon a full-time source of income. Yeah, I think you have your cake and you get to eat it too. Right? Obviously, if you have a <laughs> wide-angle lens here, people seeing I've eaten too much cake, but that's okay. It, it's only the camera. It's only the camera. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but uh, you know, I think I think that's it. You really you were able to take a, a asset that you didn't pay much for that was now worth a substantial amount and control your tax picture in retirement better. Right. There's a risk here. The Tax Cuts and Jobs Act is set to sunset in 2025. This is something we talk to clients about. Hey, we might be in a higher tax bracket situation. We don't know. But as law states now, it might be higher. So if your if inflation's still high, your cost of living's going up, you need to pour more money out. It's awfully nice to have that Roth money that you can tap into. Absolutely. And we're not even talking about the more technical charitable tools like charitable remainder trust mm -hmm. and charitable remainder annuity trust. One of those tools is great. It's the same thing. Capital gains taxes are uh, realized within the charitable trust and you can invest trust assets so they don't grow at all. I mean, yeah. they, don't, you, they don't pay anything at all, but uh, I have one friend who has a, a significant property in New York 
and he mm. paid a small amount. He's putting it into a charitable trust. And he said to me, Jack, if we do this, can we invest the net assets from the sale of the house in the Berkshire Hathaway stock? And I said, you most certainly can. And I knew what he was thinking because it's a capital, you know, it's appreciating. It's not kicking out dividends, mm -hmm. but it's growing. So if he if he keeps it for five years and then sells it in five years, some of these charitable trusts have a makeup provision and he can go back and pick up the monies that he's owed from previous years when he needs it more. Yep. You know, that's a control element. Even in charitable gift annuities, and you know, I told you about the one my wife and I did uh, with the qualified charitable distribution. You don't need to do it with a qualified charitable distribution. I could I could have a hundred thousand dollars worth of stock mm -hmm. the, the, with a twenty thousand dollar basis and go to a charity or a community foundation and say, I'd like to set up a gift annuity, here are our ages, what's the payout, mm -hmm. and get a life income stream, support the charities, and only a portion of that income is taxable now. Yeah. It's not like the IRA where it's what we call WIFO. Worst in, first out. <laughs> Worst in. I, I like that. Yeah. That's not in accounting. <laughs> no offense to the spouse. It has nothing to do with that. But that's just. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So all of these things, and to your viewers, what I want to say is if you care at all about anything, you know, your family first, you need to think about these tools. And, and Josh knows about the tools. And if he doesn't know, he's smart enough to know to get somebody who can help you get done what you need to do. And it's all about your goals. It's not about the government's goals. And I like to, I have a chart. If you go to my website, it's, it's linked there uh, of three priorities. Okay. There's your priority. There's the charity's priority mm -hmm. and there's the government's priority. And if you look at who falls where on the list, you know, on the government's priority, the number one is the government. Absolutely. Yeah. And the number two priority on the government's list is Government organizations. No cap. So it could be welfare. It could be sure, military. Sure, sure. It could be roads. It could be Planned Parenthood. It could be anything. Mm -hmm. But I don't necessarily agree with everything the government does. Yeah, and I, and I don't think, you know, I think that the challenge with government is it's mass consensus, right? Mm -hmm. It's not necessarily, hey, I feel this way. Or people in the community that you live in. Yeah. I think one of the things that we try to do at Leonard Advisory Group is support the cares and concerns of our community. Yeah. So whether that's the Red Door or this year for Shred Day, we're partnering with North Hills Community Outreach. One of the things that they said that they don't get donated that frequently is cleaning supplies. So right. spring cleaning, right? We're all thinking about it, um, you know, for underprivileged families in the area. To me, I don't really think about cleaning supplies that much, but it's certainly a need that needs to be yeah. fulfilled. I know we're on a tight schedule, but I want to share this. You mentioned North Hills Community Outreach. My dear mother, who one day turned to me, she's been gone out two years and said, Jackie, she called me Jackie, don't anybody call me Jackie. <laughs> Jackie, do you think I should be driving? She was 88 at the time. She could barely see over the steering wheel, you know, one of those. And I said, Mom, if you're asking me the question, the answer is no. She said, I'd like to give the car to somebody. North Hills Community mm -hmm. Outreach was a place. They came to the house. They took all of the information. She had all of her mechanical reports. And uh, she said, I need to tell you that when I took it in the last time, they told me I'd need about $600 to fix the car. It had 18,000 miles on it. The car was like <laughs> 15 years old, driven by the little old lady from yep, the North Hills yep. of Pittsburgh. And like the guy laughed. I was there with her, and he said, ma'am, people normally don't tell us that, but we have mechanics. And what would it cost you 600 will cost us 200 Yep. And yep. we appreciate it. And let me tell you, as Paul Harvey used to say, the rest of the story, about six months later, my mother got a card from a gentleman who said, I want to thank you for giving me your car. My family was able to use it. I got a job because of it, and you helped change our life. My mother started crying. I got to tell you, yeah. that still moves me. That's what philanthropy is. Yeah. And Churchill said, we make a living by what we get, mm -hmm. but we make a life by what we give. And nothing could be more true. And if you really have that spirit, You'll want to make more money from him so that you can give more money away to people who need it. Yeah. That is the joy of giving and the joy of living. And that's why I, I'm excited by what I do. And when I die, 
not if. A lot of my friends say, if I die, you're going to get this or that. When I die, there will be more money that passes to charity than I earned at a job during my lifetime. And that's because of leveraging tools. And that's also because of bequests. That's the easiest one. And there's two kinds of gifts. There's be bequests that are revocable or gifts that are revocable and irrevocable. A bequest is a revocable and you can change your mind anytime. But some of these other gifts, like the annuity we talked about and the qualified charitable distribution, those are irrevocable. You don't need to know all this stuff. You need to know that they can happen. You need to know what you want to do. And when you determine that, then you talk to Josh or your accountant or whoever, you get direction and it can happen. That's what's exciting. It can happen and you know, you'll know you feel the difference. Yeah, my mom's still with me every time I I do something. Um, I don't want to talk about that. Under understandable, Jack. I, uh, I I really appreciate you sharing the car story. I think that is um, my my grandmother recently passed and drove past the time that she should have. And I, <laughs> I I think that these are real experiences that we have, and that you can take a tool that you're no longer needing due to changes in your life and give it to someone else to sort of jumpstart their life right. to get to a point right. where hopefully they can do the same or return the favor in the See, future. That's is not so money. powerful. That's not money. That's tangible, yeah. personal property. You know, and we always think of money, which is why we're sometimes hesitant to do something. Mm -hmm. It doesn't have to be. And it can 80% of the time, how you give can benefit you as much as it benefits the charity. Yeah, and I think for us, we we talk with clients too as you know a risk uh, reduction strategy, right? So maybe you worked for a company for a long time, you have a lot of ABC company stock, mm -hmm. and you don't want to sell it because you pretty much didn't pay anything for it, and it's going to cause you a big tax situation. Well, great, you could donate that stock to a charity. You could donate that stock to a donor advised fund as well and distribute it whenever the heck you want, I, you know, we've talked about uh, the, the charitable annuities as well. Right. There are so many options there. And at the end of the day, what you did is, well, you got the tax deduction. You supported a cause that you cared about. And from our perspective, you reduced the risk in your portfolio yeah. as well. And, and that is an important factor because I had a donor at a charity in the north who had all of his stock in Western Pennsylvania bank stock, which had accumulated $3 million. Yeah. And... Um, what he did was he loved the company. It, it, it became Integra. It changed into something else. And he said, I really like this stock. I said, well, then sell it. He said, oh, the capital gain's terrible. He put it into a charitable remainder trust. Okay. The yep. trust sold the stock. He then had the trust rebuy the stock. And some of it he put in the cash to generate more income for him to live on. Mm -hmm. And one of the neat things about a charitable trust, you're required by law to take out 5% a year. Okay. Now there are ways you, if it doesn't generate the 5%, you can make it up in later years or you can, you can't take it out because it's not there. But your question about diversification specifically ties with particularly people who own small businesses or mm -hmm. uh, you know, family wealth situations. These are outstanding tools. And one of my biggest, you know, I'm not a big fan of insurance unless it's term. That's my, my favorite. That's the best bang for the buck. However, where whole life plays a huge role in estate planning is when somebody does have estate tax situ situations, and they may have one in 26. Sure. Once this sunset yep, law yep. hits our, our tax situation, you buy, you use the tax deduction from the gift to buy second to die or wealth replacement insurance. So the kids get their inheritance, mm -hmm. the charity gets the gift. You avoid the capital gains. You avoid the state tax. And I mean, this is exciting stuff. And I'm a poor guy. And I help these rich people keep stuff, but I encourage them to give more of it away. That's the beauty of my job. Yeah, I, and I think um, as you were saying that, I, I want to be clear to listeners, these aren't strategies that you have to have like $10 million for. Right. I mean, you could have maybe inherited a piece of property. And my family, my uh, great-grandfather had went out west years ago, and part of his journey out west was farming at a farm in Michigan. And part of his wages were a small plot of land on this farm that pretty much no one ever touched for years. 
you can gift an asset like that. I mean, it doesn't have to be something of of uh, you know gigantic value. For many folks, maybe they got some 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 stock from a company like we right. talked about, or uh, maybe uh, you know it's just they saved. They were a little bit too good at saving in their IRAs, and yeah. we want to use a normal qualified charitable distribution. Where now you're age seventy three or older, you're forced to take those yeah. distributions. If you send them directly to the church or local charity, it's a non-taxable event. Yeah, two things I just want to follow up on. First of all, now you know how Josh got the the, the Detroit or the Michigan base of Leonard <laughs> well, Advisory I'm further, Group. I'm yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> um, but the second thing is that there are two different numbers for that required minimum distribution rule. Seventy three and a half is the rule for required minimum distribution takeouts, but it's still seventy and a half to. Do the QCD. For the QCD, which is important because you can be doing that earlier and actually knocking down the size of your traditional IRA pool. Prior to the force. Prior to getting the required distribution. So all of these things having a, and this is why you get a third party. You know, Mm -hmm. I, I'm a believer of the Clint Eastwood philosophy of investments. And that is. A man's got to know his limitations. Mm -hmm. And no matter how much I know based on what I do, there's much, much more I don't know because I'm not a specialist in everything. I'm a specialist in one area. And Josh looks at my stuff, and we've had a couple disagreements, but I will humbly point out that he was right when he gave me. Jack, that's how you've been married for so long. (laughs) Now, my (laughs) wife has great patience. Um I, I just think there's a great opportunity for your viewers and listeners to make a difference. And uh, leaving a legacy doesn't require a lot of money. It just requires you living your faith, trusting that good overcomes evil, no matter what the world looked like today, and and keeping your perspectives in order. And even when your kids walk away and ignore you, when you're gone, they'll recognize the value of what you've taught them. I can tell you that uh, from experience. I have a much greater appreciation of my parents now. When my son turned 21 and called me from Penn State from a bar at midnight, he said, Dad, it's amazing how smart you look now that I turned 21. <laughs> you know, um, he And he was a designated driver on the night he turned 21. So, oh, wow. Wow. Um, I love my family. I love this city. And I love the organizations that help make this a better place. And that's what I've committed my life to support. And that's the end of my story. So unless yeah. you have any other questions, no. I have nothing else to say. No, I think that was perfect. And I think your your passion for giving clearly comes through. And uh, it's great. I, I know, I think it was last week you were, you had a, a speech that you were giving as well. So, yeah. um, you know, I think it's great that you're still able to present material, share with others and encourage them as well. That's sort of the best work. I always say for us, it's amazing that we get to hang out with people and help them with their problems. What a great job. I'm going to give you one last story. If we are okay time-wise, I don't want to. um, I was given a month to live in 2018. And I was in the hospital. My oncologist uh, was there. And I said to him, "Uh, Doc, do you find that people who have faith and are outgoing and are giving people have better outcomes, better prognoses? He says, Absolutely. He said, those people aren't afraid of dying because they've spent their time giving. Mm -hmm. That's living. And the more I reflected on that, think about that. I was supposed to be dead in a month. I was diagnosed February uh, of 18. They said I was lucky to have a month. I didn't even know Josh. And I called the advisors I had at the time, forced my wife to sit in on the call. She hates that stuff. And, um, here we are, you know, six, seven years later. Why am I still alive? Well, part of that may be to share this message with you. I don't know. I trust God. He's smarter than I am, uh, <laughs> needless to say. But that's that's the message I, I have to give you. No matter what your situation is, 100 years from now, we're all going to be in a better place. And if you don't have anything else to do, think about that and uh, explore it and then experience the joy of giving that's yeah yeah well well thank you 
Jack, thanks for coming on. Oh. Thanks for sharing uh, all your great stories with us today and your knowledge. Um, if anyone wants to learn more about Jack, they can check out his website at jackoutsidethebox.net. Um, you can find all of his contact information there. We will put a link in the show notes so people can easily access that, as well as a little bit about Jack's story as well and his giving story. I think that's great information uh, for listeners to hear. Uh, Jack, thanks again so much for oh, coming on. My pleasure. Uh, for all you listeners, if you're looking to explore charitable giving techniques, we're always happy to help you discuss your goals around your financial plan and how that might pair in with your charitable giving techniques. To schedule a time to talk with someone at the Leonard Advisory Group, you can click the link in the show notes to schedule a 15-minute phone call. Until next time, thanks for listening. Make sure to like, subscribe, and follow. Thank <laughs> you.